As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. Today we have with us a medical doctor who's worked both inside and outside the system. He's become an expert on off-grid survival. He worked for over 13 years with the U.S. FDA approving drugs and getting them to market until he became such a whistleblower there that he was blacklisted, left that relationship, formed his own private practice, and as he said, stepped away from the green machine, the insurance industry, and instead became a cash-only business. He took the leap of faith that by providing direct services to individuals, people, and families who were concerned about their wellness rather than about following the system's protocols, they could help them in more ways. He calls himself an integrative physician. He'll tell us more about that. Even more remarkable, he became an expert in off-grid survival and health and wellness. He founded and is the head of a mission in Haiti, which has built a compound capable of supporting over 20 host families, as well as hundreds of people in the surrounding community of thousands. He'll tell us more about his off-grid medical survival skills and help us to keep our families well and safe, no matter what may come our way. The name of our off-grid wellness and survival expert is Dr. J. Nielsen, MD. I had the privilege of interviewing him live and in person, We'll now join that interview in progress, starting out with Dr. Nielsen introducing himself, his practice, and leading us into what we need to do to prepare for our family's wellness in any situation that comes our way. I'm a family physician who has specialized in wellness medicine now okay. for 20 years. I do integrative medicine using both traditional and alternative techniques. I do a lot of specialization in avoiding joint replacement surgery and spine surgery by using natural remedies that work very well. And uh, this particular subject of talking about readiness and preparedness is near and dear to my heart because I've been working in Haiti now for 13 years doing exactly that. I have my you know uh, own you know hidey hole where I plan to go if things fall apart. And I've spent much much money and many many 54 trips now. I mean, I have a lot of things down there. I have an entire welding lab. I have an entire grizzly wood shop. You know, I have everything I need to run an entire city. Okay, you know, I've got 300 solar panels and you know power supplies and 50,000 gallons of roof water storage and 14 miles of fence and 40 acres of drip irrigation. Okay, I'm ready to farm, feed myself, protect myself. But it's more important that you not huddle. It's more important that you be productive. I'm not down there just to make sure that I survive if things fall apart. I want that whole community of 2,000 Haitians that are my friends that live around me to um, benefit from the Americans I brought to live there. Otherwise, they're going to be jealous. I need them employed. I need them fed I, because they're my security. You can't get to me in the Sabinette because you have to come down a road and walk past 60 of my employees and I'm going to know you're in the Sabinette before you know you're in the Sabinette. From your learnings that you've done and the help that you've offered folks in Haiti, what uh, examples come to mind as the most essential supplies that the ordinary family has, should really have and be, be equipped to use? Uh, if there were to be some kind of natural disaster or some kind of emergency where they really didn't have access to the usual support system that they have here. Well, think about that project logically. And the answer is, is what are your life-threatening risks? Okay? And the first one is infection. Okay? So you want to have something, you know, what if your 10-year-old daughter gets pneumonia and the healthcare system goes down for two weeks? Uh, you need an antibiotic. You're, you're in trouble if you don't have an antibiotic. I have some alternatives to that, but generally an antibiotic would be number one. Doxycycline, good broad spectrum, affordable, effective, rarely anybody allergic to it. Good thing to stockpile. Then you have your viral infections. Oh, they're tougher. Okay, we don't have much down that path in the opinion of traditional medicine. In fact, we have five wonderful tools. Okay. We have olive leaf powder, 
very effective at stopping viruses. I can stop any cold in a day with four capsules on, at least four times a day. I would take it during anything, including Ebola. We have liquid vitamin D, 2,000 units per drop, eight drops a day, 16,000 units for three days. Very, very antiviral. We have colloidal silver, an entire discussion all in itself. There's clear colloidal silver, which is toxic, and there's the colloidal silver that's smoky colored, which is actually atomic silver. Very, very effective and a good antiviral product. Okay? And, and then we have some known herbal therapies other than olive leaf that we can find that improve the immune system. Moringa, the miracle tree, that very cheap to buy a pound bag of that and keep it in inventory. And then Artemisia annua animad, which is the plant I'm growing in Haiti to treat multiple drug resistant malaria. Uh, it has been used in clinical trials and doubles the survival of HIV used with Moringa. So there are a lot of tools out there that are antiviral. The doctor, you know, the pharmacologist from Germany who developed Artemisia as an herbal therapy for malaria just sent a worldwide alert out that we need to be planting Moringa and Artemisia all over the world getting ready for Ebola because we have no therapies. And of course they won't listen to them. But he's absolutely right. We could we could knock the mortality in half. How can an ordinary family who might want to do what you just said obtain a, a supply of seeds or plantings or whatever? Moringa is a tree that only grows tropically, so you would need to. You will usually end up buying moringa from a missionary. Many missions, like mine, um, it, are growing moringa for commercial product, and it type moringa yeah, powder in the internet. You'll find many many sellers. Um, and so and it keeps, so I'm not, yeah, it's easy to find. The Artemisia, uh, you only really have two choices. Uh, one thing that you can do is go up on Onamed's website and pay for 5,000 seeds, which is 4,990 more seeds than you need. Uh, and, and grow your own plants and next year you'll have it, okay? The uh, other thing you can do is um, every year Dick Bostorf, Bostorf Nursery on 25 sells it like any other garden plant. And he sold 300 of them last year and I have patients who went out and put five of them in their backyard, watered them with miracle Grow, and harvested them this fall and, and have a supply and it will keep a long time. The second thing that you go, what's a big risk when you can't get to health care is um, the uh, all of wound management. What if you get, uh, you know, a large wound, a large abrasion, an open laceration, and, and a compound fracture with open skin? You would like to be able to keep that skin medicated until you can get to care. Okay, um, and so some topical antibiotic that penetrates, like clindamycin, would be very, very useful to have. Um, because you always want to be able to manage a wound, okay? Um, the third thing is infectious diarrhea, okay? And so if you get vomiting and diarrhea and have access to no medication and IVs, you'd be dead in 48 hours. But what do you have to control that except the diet of clear liquids and carbohydrates, okay? And how do you give those if you're vomiting? So having Reglan that to stop vomiting and emodium to stop diarrhea is a very logical combination. You know, you're going to take somebody from extremist to hopefully controllable. At least now you can give them liquids and stay on top of it. And I would combine that with owning a can of a product called Vitalite. And Vitalite is like the Gatorade of professionals. It has all the trace minerals. It's not a sports drink. It doesn't contain sugar. It's 100% electrolytes and water. And you can buy a can of it for $16 and it gets you through 10 illnesses. It's like a three pound tub. And so the, the viral illnesses are, you know, in, in that category mm -hmm. we go, that's, that's at risk. Um, it, one of the things that you would like to have is to be able to control pain. Now, that's a problem. Those are all narcotics. I mean, other than Tylenol and Motrin, which can be pretty good, and we should have those, okay? Um, but, you know, if a family member has pain meds and they're done with their wrist fracture and there's six tablets left in the bottle, I would throw those away. I would keep those. I would repurpose them for a survival kit because most pain 
Mother Nature rehandles for you in about 48 hours to half the pain you had acutely. But the first 48 hours can be pretty brutal. And what if you have to transport someone or move someone? So, you know, pain relief really becomes, you know, a big issue. And so being able to do those subjects, I think, is, is our big topic. On any of those, if you're going to have these things on, on the shelf for a period of time, is there anything you can do to increase their shelf life so that they're still viable? Yes. Um, it, it would be hard on an individual basis to do... Uh, if we put together a product package where all these things were available to people, I would put them in a sealed case and uh, evacuate the oxygen with nitrogen. Clearly we want no heat, no temperature change, no light, and no change in humidity. You want to treat these meds pretty much like good wine. You want to get them in a stable, zero light, zero change, zero humidity environment and keep them sealed. The expiration date on meds is not correct. The mission industry has actually done a lot of research, and except for doxycycline, my favorite drug for an emergency kit, which is it gets old, turns toxic, and you have to replace it every two years. Okay, that's in good storage. Okay, put it in the sun, you have to replace it immediately. Okay, but short of that, one single category of drug, doxycycline, minocycline. All other drugs are going to maintain 80% of their potency without turning into anything toxic over 10 years. So that's without putting them under nitrogen. That's without carefully putting them in your wine cooler environment. Drugs are, have, I, I have an, a, a um, topical cleason that I've used since college and it still works and I'm 64 years old. I have a, uh, not a steroid cream that I use for an occasional rash that I've had since med school. It still works. You know, drugs don't really go bad if they're in the right container. And so we want to be careful that we store them correctly. That's key. So beyond uh, antibiotics, antivirals, and wound care, was there anything else that, that uh, comes to mind as something that, oh, and you mentioned uh, pain, pain medication. And, and, and the viral illness with vomiting and diarrhea. Right. The next thing I'm probably concerned about is uh, life-threatening threatening reactions. If I were going to keep one medicine, it would be cortisone as prednisone. Because if you get a bee sting or an asthma reaction or a bad arthritic flare-up or anything that really is going to go bad, you're going to blunt it with oral cortisone and it's very cheap. And so, you know, owning 40 10 milligram prednisone tablets would be kind of a good idea. My view of anybody that I don't know what they have and they look like they're going to die and I don't have anything, I'm probably going to give them cortisone and hope it helps. I'm probably not going to do I'm probably going to err on the side of getting a good result if I do that. They're probably dying from inflammation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and uh, also you had mentioned earlier in our discussion before we started about antihistamines. Oh, so absolutely. Benadryl, again, along with, uh, you know, before you go to the cortisone, obviously antihistamines are a sleeping pill. Okay. Um, and also would re cover that severe reaction. Another one would be, our next thing we're worried about is our airway, okay? We just, um, we're watching this new virus go through America and these kids are, that have asthma are in real trouble, okay? Um, and so, you know, having a single combivant or provental inhaler, better yet, a nebulizer if you've got power and the solution that works even better, would be a wonderful way to manage any airway problems and be able to stabilize them.